Good morning. Out here in a beautiful fall morning, not a cloud in the sky. Very chilly though. It's below freezing when I got up. I think it still might be below freezing. But I wanted to paint this beautiful autumn scene. We have this nice tree. And it's not in the most pitch, picturesque place. But the tree itself is beautiful. And in our modern world, that's kind of par for the course. You're going to run into situations where you might see something beautiful by itself and what it's surrounded by is not quite as nice. So we make do, and that's what we're going to do with this painting. I'm Jason Taco. Welcome to my channel. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. You might not know if you like it yet, but hopefully you will by the time we're done. By the way, let me tell you my colors here. You have titanium white, cadmium yellow light. This is this brand of cadmium yellow light is almost cadmium lemon. And you're gonna find that with different brands, you're gonna get different um, results, different uh, shades of that pigment. Cadmium orange, this cadmium orange is a little more mellow. This is uh, Gamblin's 1980 colors. Yellow ochre, cadmium red, transparent red oxide. I usually have these flipped. I didn't today, it was just a oops on my part. A lizard permanent, or lizard crimson actually. Ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, cerulean blue, viridian, and chromium green oxide. Okay, so I brushed in a very thin blue color. And I want to get in the general shape of the tree. And my focus is really just on this tree. The background, as I indicated before, is not the most intriguing in the world. So I want to get the character of this tree in. The tree is going to take up most of the painting. And if you're new, especially to plein air painting, this is a good way to start. Don't go out and try to make a grandiose masterpiece with everything in it, including the kitchen sink. Just do a study, you know, if you're having a struggle with trees, just go out and do trees. And I would hi highly encourage drawing trees too with a pencil. I could tell you this is already, if I leave this like this, this is gonna be kind of a boring composition. So let's, I don't obsess too much about composition when I'm out plein air painting, I'm more after colors and values. But if I see something that is glaring, I will make the change to it. Or a change to it, I should say. Just wanna shift that tree over a little bit. I really wanna get the light side of it. And I'm just using transparent red oxide here. And it gets exaggerate some of the character of this tree. Go a little bit bigger with it. Okay, so let's find the darkest dark in this landscape. 
when I look at it, it's going to be the trunk of the tree. So I want to get that dark in there right away. And when you go out to paint something, or even when you're painting from photos, if you're seeing some colors that you're not totally sure of, but you see other colors that you are sure of, paint the colors that you know first. And save the ambiguous stuff for later. A little hint of green in there, so let's get that in. So I saw this more ambiguous, this ochre tone, and it wasn't ambiguous to me. I've painted outside many times, so I kind of knew what this ochre tone would be. Now I'm getting in some of the green. Now we're obviously at the end of the summer, so I've been painting greens all summer. So I'm pretty confident as to what color they need to be. I'm a little less confident about the oranges in the tree. Just because it's been it's been a while since I painted orange was that intense. The sunlight is very intense out here, and I'm wearing my trusty cowboy hat. The reason I wear that is a because it looks really cool. I'm just kidding. It does look kind of cool, but the main reason I wear it is because it keeps the sun out of my eyes. The sun is pretty low. It's still fairly early in the morning. And without that hat, it's hard for me to make out the colors and everything on my palette. Sometimes plein air painting is difficult just because you can't see because of the intense sunlight out there. If that's the case, go buy yourself a nice, you know, hat with a big um, rim on it or brim or whatever they call those things and you might be surprised at how much it helps. Okay, keeping everything pretty thin at this point. There's a road in this scene, but I'm going to leave the road out because I think it looks better without the road. Alright, so let's go for the shadow side of that tree.
Now I want to compare the sa shadow side of that tree with these greens that I put over here. You know, what is the main value and color difference that I'm seeing there? You don't want to stare at it too long. I'm just doing a quick glance at it and then I start painting. If you stare too much at that shadow side, you're going to start seeing all kinds of things in there, all kinds of colors, and you're going to lose the feeling, you're going to lose the um, your view of the big relationships. I used to think when I would go out and plein air paint, and this is a big mistake, and I think a lot of beginning artists will make this mistake, is I used to think I had to go out and just really intensely look in here and capture every nuance in here to make the painting work. And that's completely false. You can do that toward the end if you have the time, but your goal should be just to capture the overall relationships between here and the sky and these trees and the ground plane. And I've known some plein air artists who will work really fast on purpose because of that. Because if they if they have too too much time, they'll actually uh, get too uh, deep in the weeds on stuff that's kind of irrelevant. Now for the light side of the tree, just because I want a base to work on, I'm going to thin this paint out. that trunk in there. That's another thing too is if you put in some inconsequential detail and it's getting in your way just get rid of it and paint it back in later. What I really need to capture is this form up the tree. And the form is defined by the shadows and the light areas. So I'd really rather have this form of the tree be strong than, oh look at that nice little tree trunk he got in there. Think big when you're out plein air painting. Think big when you're painting, period. It's the big relationships and getting the big relationships correct that's going to give your painting power and it's going to make it look good. Just want to let you know, I uh, teach live online painting classes, do it through Zoom. Some of the best online instruction you're going to get. We meet on Saturdays. I take it through a painting step by step from start to finish. I explain all the colors, color mixtures. We go much slower because we can. And I will critique your paintings, give you feedback. So there's a lot of online instruction out there where you're just watching a video and that's it. And I do have that. I have that for if you just want to watch my monthly demos for half the cost, you can do that. And I have a number of people who do that and they like that. They can Every month I put up a new demo plus they get access to the live Q&A and critique sessions. 
but I also have live membership which opens once a month and that's nice because it's more personalized attention if that's what you like so if you're interested sign up on the waiting list below and I'll let you know when a spot opens if you want to jump in on the demo only version right away send me an email jason at jasontaco.com and I'll give you the link and you can sign up right away right now you can learn how to do at least 10 paintings I'm not sure when I get this published it might even be more but I have at least 10 paintings up there that you can learn how to do starting right away when you become a member and every month I'm uploading new new material Okay, this is the tricky part, getting the relationships between here and here. And the sun is constantly moving, so we're going to end up more and more in shadow. The most intense part of this tree is right down here. I think part of that is because, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm subconsciously comparing it to the darker colors here. Up here we get into the light sky and therefore these colors up here are not going to look as bright and as intense. They very well could be. But because we're comparing it to that dark or that light sky, it's just not going to look that way. So this paint that I put on this dark paint is pretty thick. It's almost too thick to work with. So I'm gonna. I don't want to scrape it off completely, but I definitely want to as the late great James James Brown used to say, break it down. I love James Brown. I used to be a bass player, <clears throat> a musician. Loved R&B music, Motown, James Brown. All that, it's good stuff. So the key to doing these scenes with, when you see this intense color, is don't jump on the intensity right away. There is a, if you, if you look carefully, now there is a point where you do want to look somewhat carefully at your scene. After you get your big relationships established, then you can start to look more carefully at the little things going on. And if you do look carefully at this tree, you will see areas where it's a little more neutralized where the orange oranges are not quite as intense and they might be even a little darker that's what you want to paint first you want to paint the more neutralized things first and then build and the darker things first and then build up to the more intense stuff as you go if you jump right into that intensity right away it's probably just gonna drive you nuts Especially when you get into these little 
parts in the dark areas here. If you go super bright with those, they're usually going to look really obnoxious. So start out So start out more toned down. You can always get more intense as you go by adding thicker paint. There's a neat shape right there that I want to get. Just goes up like that, comes down. Make sure you squint at the scene too when you look at it. If you look at it with wide open eyes, it's gonna drive you crazy. Somebody just started using some kind of power tool in their shed. If you want to uh, support my channel on Patreon, there's a link below. And depending on what level, I'm going to be, I got some nice perks there. So just check it out. There's different membership levels and when you go there, there's the top three levels, but ooh, I hope I didn't break my pallet knife. I think I'm on the verge of breaking my pallet knife. Not good. These pallet knives are kind of cheap and they they don't last very long. But anyway, there's different membership levels and if you, you know, check out all four depending on, you know, how much support you want to give and your resources because there's some cool perks for some of the higher levels. 
I'll just kind of leave it at that. But check it out below, it really helps me out too. Yep, I got a big crack in my power knife, so it's not going to last much longer. I was wondering when that was going to happen. I do have my big power knife, but the little one works very nice. gonna switch to my bigger one see if I can paint good with that I like the paint do a lot of foliage work with a palette knife because it keeps for me anyway it's a nice mental um, don't know what you call it but barrier or something like that keeps me from getting too too tight helps me to focus more just on the fundamentals and Especially in dealing with foliage. Foliage, we can get so muddled up on wanting to capture all this little stuff. And the palette knife, it helps, it helps keep me thinking big, let's just put it that way. And it's really nice for making sure you don't overblend. I tell my students in my workshops when they have over blending issues to just put the brush down and get the palette knife out especially when dealing with foliage But we are going to switch back to a brush. I want to get some of that more intense foliage in there now. have to replenish my cadmium yellow light I see as I get into the smaller shapes right in here I'm gonna get darker with my mixture Because I keep if I keep it as light as it is here, it's gonna be too light.
I better replenish that cadmium yellow light. Okay, I want to go in and work in that shadow area a little bit more. Ooh, that's way too green. I dipped into some chromium green oxide and that stuff's powerful. Too powerful. Okay, as I make adjustments to the light side, I'm seeing that my shadow side is uh, might be a little too dark. I want to be careful though, I want to squint at it. Squinting at it is going to help me maintain those bigger relationships. And it makes sense that for the most part I'd have to go lighter because what we're painting over here and in here, I mean this is foliage too. So it's gonna be it's gonna be sticking out and catching some of the cooler skylight. And having a transparent dark in there can kind of give the illusion that it's a hole rather than foliage that just is not getting direct sunlight. We started with that because you need to start somewhere, you need a base, but definitely don't want to end with uh, darks that are too dark. Now up here they do look darker and the primary reason for that is because we have all this bright sky around it. In fact, before I go much further, I do want to block in some more of that sky, get more certainty of that color. all about relationships and you're always subconsciously keying one color and one value off the other whether you realize it or not and if you're kind of uncertain about things here it might be because you need to get this established in here first before you can really be sure
summertime, I usually wait until the end to do the sky, but I usually have a little more confidence in the summertime with my colors and values. Intense autumn foliage in intense sunlight is a bit more tricky, at least for me. So I'm going to get everything locked in. I think part of it too is autumn is a very fleeting time of year. These trees, they're going to stay like this for just a few days. I mean, I could literally come up after a few days and this tree will be wiped out. So we don't usually see these color combinations for very long. Um, whereas summertime, I mean, you, you see summer foliage for months. And in a certain way, bare foliage in wintertime too. But this time of year is incredibly fleeting. So I think it can be a little more challenging to capture, you know, what you're seeing and be really confident about it. Because this intense color is not common in nature. I want to get some sky holes in. And I'm really bumming out that my palette knife is breaking because I love using a palette knife for sky holes. There's a big one right over here. And I'm gonna try my almost broken pallet knife for that. See how much more I can get away with before this palm knife completely breaks.
don't want to put in too many sky holes, but it is uh, a little bit characteristic with autumn trees that they're going to have some or more than your uh, normal landscape would, your normal summer trees, just because you know foliage is dropping off these trees. Thankfully, I have a replacement palette knife at home. I should have brought it with me, but didn't think I'd have this problem today. I should know, though, these palette knives are kind of like a transmission in a car or bearings. When they go, they just go, and a lot of times there's no no warning about it. As we get toward the top, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. It actually starts to darken a little bit at the very edges where it meets the sky. And I think it, it's probably just because of how our eye perceives it against a more light sky. But if that's how your eye sees it, then paint it. Don't try to explain it all to yourself or try to rationalize it. Just Go ahead and paint it the way you see it. It's the whole reason why you're out here. That and to listen to power tools in people's sheds.
let's do a little bit of softening. And when I do the softening, what I try to do is look at the tree while squinting. That's going to give you a nice overall impression of how the edges should look. This is a part where I start to see, this is a part where you can really start to look into the tree. Once you get these big relationships established, then you can start to look really carefully in there and see like, oh, okay, there's a little hint of green in here. You know, there's a little hint of red. This looks slightly more orange than the other area. But you wanna save that after you get the big relationships established. Because if you go in and you try to do those little subtle things right away, you could end up doing the entire thing the wrong value or even the wrong color temperature just because you're putting it on a subject that the whole big shape is not in correct relationship to this big shape right here. So when you go and st you start muddling with all the little stuff inside, you know, you're putting it on the big shape, which in the big shape is wrong. So you gotta have a firm foundation to build upon. Okay, got my palette pretty much cleaned off, replenish some colors. Let's see how much more I can get away with before this palette knife breaks.
Okay, and let's refine this trunk a little bit. The trunk is going to show mainly in the dark areas. Uh, if you enjoyed this too, I asked about liking this video. Also, I have a number of other videos on my channel you can watch. So uh, be sure to check that out. If you wait till the end, there uh, will be a couple recommendations that will pop up. But you can just bring up my channel here on YouTube and I have a lot of videos and there's more coming so you may want to consider subscribing hit the notification bell when you subscribe because that will notify you whenever I post a new video I try to usually post on Saturdays and I've been able to keep doing it it's a lot of work though. One of these days I'll probably miss one because I have family and everything and yeah, it's pretty time consuming on top of uh, painting and teaching and everything else. So I hope you enjoy it and find it helpful. And if you do and you want to let me know in the comment section, it'd be great. person could really stop right here and go home with a nice sketch but I'm going to try to work this up to a more finished painting at least more finished than what it is Let's tackle the area around here. Fairly ambiguous, kind of neutral colors here. I'm just going to try to capture the overall effect.
Yeah, that background, I'm just squinting at that. Don't need to capture every single little tree and the shape of it. I just need the approximate colors and most importantly values that are going to resonate with this tree and help it make sense. So as I go a little bit darker back here, it really helps make this tree, brings that tree out more, it really helps it to sing, which is exactly what I want. There is back there a little bit of hint of autumn color. So I'm going to stick it in just to kind of harmonize it. And we have this over here. Let's test this out and see how that looks. That's pretty good. See, the areas of sun that are hitting these green trees here are going to help the, shadows, the shadow side of this tree make more sense. this real dark area under here. At this point, most of the stuff back here, I'm just squinting at the scene. I'm not even trying to explain what it is. There's no need to. Just want to get the approximate lights and darks and we're in good shape.
And that's one of the keys to uh, to planner painting. The painting period is don't paint stuff. Don't paint ground or don't paint trees. Paint color shapes and value shapes. And just ask yourself what color and value is that shape and how hard and soft are the edges and where does that shape go and how big or small is that shape compared to what's next to it that's really all painting is in a, in a nutshell And when you break it down to that, trust me, it makes your job a lot easier. And if you do it correctly, it's going to look like you're seeing at the end. But if you obsess over, oh my goodness, I got to paint grass, and I got to paint the tree, and I got to paint this and that, and you start thinking not about shapes, but about stuff, and all oh, well, that cynical neighbor guy who tells me all about his uncle who used to paint trains and how good he was and is he gonna know what this is? Is he gonna think it's good? You start thinking like that, then you've lost. So just paint shapes and just ask yourself what color and what value are those shapes? What shape is it? And most shapes are abstract, okay? Which is good because that's what makes it interesting. And there's a tendency when you first start out to want to paint the shapes very um, more geometric and you'll get over that over time but most shapes are abstract but you gotta ask yourself you know what color and what value are they how big how small and that's in relation to what's next to it and where do I stick them on the canvas if you get those, if you get all that correct, you got a good painting. And what's nice about that approach is you don't have to be a genius and know exactly what species of tree you're painting. or You don't even have to know things like human anatomy if you're painting people. You just have to see the shape see the color and value and paint it as it is but learning how to do that can take quite a while and a lot of what good instruction is is having somebody just tell you, hey, that shape's wrong. You gotta fix that. The color of that shape is wrong. The value of that shape is wrong. And what I made by wrong is in relation to what's next to it. Or that shape's in the wrong spot, or it's the wrong size.
I think I might have gone a hair too light in this area here. Which was probably difficult for me to notice without having everything blocked in yet. Okay, clean out the palette, replenish some colors. Just gonna do some final touch-ups here. Some final punches of color. we go up here it just seems to get darker and more red to me bit too intense with the red. Let's tone that down with some Viridian.
Okay, I think we're going to call that a sketch. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and we will see you again. Yeah.